Hello friends. Um, today I'm going to discuss about hyperprolactinemia, an endocrine society guideline for the management and diagnosis of hyperprolactinemia. My name is Dr. Santosh Abraham. I'm working as a specialist registrar in endocrinology and diabetes at the uh, Scarborough General Hospital. So let's start now. So, to diagnose hyperprolactinemia, the society recommends establishing the diagnosis of hyperprolactinemia. A single measurement of serum prolactin. So, if it is above the upper limit of the normal, it confirms the diagnosis. So, make sure that there was no excessive venipuncture. Now, they don't recommend against dynamic testing of prolactin secretion for the diagnosis of prolactinemia, hyperprolactinemia. And in patients with asymptomatic hyperprolactinemia, they suggest assessing for macroprolactin. So dynamic tests using TRH, L-DOPA, and domperidone are not superior to measuring a single serum prolactin sample for the diagnosis. And also, some of the drugs, like risperidone and metoclopramide, could cause prolactin elevation about 200 microgram per liter without the evidence of uh, prolactinoma. So it should be also borne in mind. So why they are asking? Uh, to look for macroprolactin when you have asymptomatic hyperprolactinemia. Well, we all know that 85% of the circulating prolactin is in the monomeric form, but in addition to this monomeric form, the serum also contains a covalently bound dimeric big prolactin. So it has a much large polymeric form and it's called the big big prolactin. So, uh, so the serum contains uh, a dimeric form called the big prolactin and also another larger polymeric form, the big, big prolactin. So macroprolactinemia macro occurs when there is preponderance of uh, circulating prolactin with these large molecules. So these large prolactin forms, the macroprolactins, are less bioactive and it should be suspected when the typical symptoms of hyperprolactinemia are absent. Because my macroprolactinemia is a common cause of hyperprolactinemia, routine screening for macroprolactin could eliminate unnecessary diagnostic testing and treatment. Now, if there is a discrepancy between a very large pituitary tumor and a mildly elevated prolactin level, they recommend a serial dilution of serum samples to eliminate an artifact. So this can occur with some of the assays, leading to a falsely low prolactin value called the hook effect. So prolactinomas in general, serum prolactins parallel tumor size. Most patients with prolactin levels higher than 250 microgram per liter will harbor a prolactinoma. So macroprolactinomas, which are more than 10 millimeter in diameter, are typically associated with prolactin levels greater than 250 microgram per liter. But this size is not always consistent with the serum prolactin level. So this one reason could be the hook effect. So it is an assay artifact that is observed when high prolactin concentrations saturate antibodies in the two-site immunoradiometric assay. So when prolactin values are not as high as expected, this assay should be repeated at a 1 is to 100 serum sample dilution to overcome this potential hook effect. Another alternative is to give a washout to, ex to eliminate excess unbound prolactin before adding the second antibody. 
So newer assays may obviate this problem and alternative reference laboratories could be used. Now going to the causes of hyperprolactinemia, it's important that you exclude medication use, renal failure, hypothyroidism and paracellular tumors in patients with symptomatic uh, non-physiological hyperprolactinemia. So coming to renal failure, we know that impaired Sorry, we know that moderate hyperprolactinemia is caused by impaired renal degradation of prolactin and also some mechanisms with the central prolactin regulation. So in one third of the patients with kidney disease, hyperprolactinemia develops because of decreased clearance and enhanced production of the hormone. This hyperprolactinemia can also contribute to hypogonadal symptoms that usually accompany CKD and menses may return after bromocryptin therapy. What about hypothyroidism? So long-term hypothyroidism can cause pituitary hyperplasia. So hyperprolactinemia and enlargement of the pituitary gland due to thyroid failure can be reversed with, by treating with L-thyroxine. And what about the paracellular tumors? We know, all know that prolactin secretion is tonically inhibited by the hypothalamic dopamine. So disruption of or compression of the pituitary stroke by a non-prolactin secreting pituitary tumor or other paracellular mass will lead to hyperprolactinemia. So a stalk effect could possibly lead to the hyperprolactinemia in this case. So patients with large non-functioning pituitary tumors like NFPAs, craniopharyngiomas or granulomatous infiltration of the hypothalamus can develop hyperprolactinemia because of the stalk compression or dopaminergic neuronal damage. And also it is important to determine whether patients with hyperprolactinemia also have acromegaly because prolactin is elevated in up to 50% of patients with GH secreting tumors. So what about drug-induced hyperprolactinemia? In a symptomatic patient with, uh, with uh, drug-induced prolactinemia, discontinue the medications for three days or substitute an alternative drug and then remeasure the serum, uh, serum prolactin. So this continuation, discontinuation or substitution should be done with consulting, after consulting the patient's physician. But if the drug cannot be discontinued and the onset of hyperprolactinemia does not coincide with uh, therapy initiation, a pituitary MRI should be done. So if the patient is symptomatic, stop the drug for three days or substitute an alternative drug. Consult the patient's physician before you make these changes. If the drug cannot be discontinued and hyperprolactinemia does not coincide with the therapy, I mean, it, it shows that the therapy hasn't produ produced hyperprolactinemia. You have to go for a pituitary MRI. So MRI will differentiate between the medication-induced hyperprolactinemia and symptomatic hyperprolactinemia due to a pituitary or hypothalamic mass. So whether it's from a stroke effect or whether it's from a pituitary tumor, the MRI will help you. In asymptomatic medication-induced hyperprolactinemia, no treatment is required and no treatment should be done. If the patient has long-term hypogonadism, 
you can use estrogen or testosterone because hypogonadism lowers the low bone mass so when we come come to this drug induced uh, hyperprolactin the most frequent cause of the uh, of drug-induced hyperprolactinemia are due to neuroleptics and antipsychotics. So when this when the drug induces hyperprolactinemia, the prolactin levels rise gradually, and it usually takes three days for the levels to return to normal after drug discontinuation. Uh, there are also reports of risk of bond loss in women with antipsychotic induced hyperprolactinemia. So the medication in this hyperprolactinemia causes prolactin levels to rise and uh, the prolactin usually ranges between 25 to 100 microgram per liter. But exceptions are metoclopramide, resperidone and phenothiazines. They can raise the prolactin exceeding 200 microgram per liter. So uh, they are dopamine antagonists and the effects, the do dopamine antagonist effects cause this. Also verapamil which is used in hypertension can block the hypothalamic dopamine and it causes hyperprolactinemia in some of the patients. Opiates and cocaine by blocking, by acting through the mu receptor also cause mild hyperprolactinemia. Even the OCPs uh, can produce mild hyperprolactinemia. So the antipsychotic agents uh, with lower and dopamine antagonist potency could be chosen. Another drug is arpipresol. This is a typical antipsychotic this is an anti uh, sorry this is a atypical antipsychotic and it causes both dopamine agonist and dopamine it has got both dopamine agonist and dopamine antagonist activity so this can lower prolactin and reverse hyperprolactinemia so these are the possible alternatives So what about what about uh, using dopamine agonist therapy? Well, dopamine agonist therapy, if the drug cannot be withdrawn, if there are no alternatives, it will normalize the prolactin level only in 75% of the cases. And it may lead to an exacerbation of the underlying cause, uh, side causes. So that's why we don't prefer it in the first line. So, in, in short, the first line is to stop the drug if clinically feasible. If it is not possible, drug with a similar action that, cause, that does not cause hyperprolactinemia such as arpipresol could be used. Arpipresol could be used. Or, we could uh, consider starting a dopamine agonist therapy but it could result in the worsening of the psychosis. So management of prolactinoma in general, the aims are to lower prolactin levels, decrease tumor size, and restore gonadal functions uh, for people who are having this symptomatic prolactin secreting tumors. So they recommend using carbagolin as first line because it has higher efficacy and it also has a higher frequency of pituitary tumor shrinkage. So it causes the tumor to shrink more than 
using other drugs like bromocryptin. So this greater effect efficacy of carbagolin can be explained because it has higher affinity for dopamine receptor binding sites. And also the incidence of unpleasant side effects is low with carbagolin drug compliance may be superior. So that's why they are recommending this carbagolin in the first line. And also bromocotrine uh, decreases tumor size by approximately 50% in two thirds of the pa patient. But Carbagolin has been shown to decrease the tumor size by 90%. So high efficacy, much better compliance and greater decreases in pituitary tumor size all favor carbagolin in preference to bromocryptin. So uh, when you have, when you are treating a patient with dopamine agonist therapy, you need to check for the prolactin levels. So after the after starting therapy, you need to check for the prolactin levels one month after, and then you need to titrate. If the patient is having a macroprolactinoma, repeat the MRI in one year or in three months. Uh, so in, in repeat the MRI in one year, if the prolactin levels continue to rise while the patient is receiving dopaminic agents or if new symptoms like galacteria, visual disturbances, headaches or hormonal disorders occur, and repeat the MRI in three months in case of macroprolactinemia. So in symptomatic patients, repeat the MRI in one year, even if they are on the dopamine agonist therapy. And in macroprolactinomas, do the MRI in three months. Also visual field examination in patients with macroadenomas at risk of impinging optic chiasm has to be done and uh, assess and manage other comorbidities such as bone loss, persistent galacteria, etc. So these are the factors which need to be kept in mind when you are managing prolactinoma with dopamine agonists. So there is no need to treat asymptomatic patients harboring uh, microprolactinomas with dopamine agonists. And treatment with a dopamine agonist or oral contraceptives in patients who are having amenorrhea caused by a microadenoma can be considered. So females who are desire of pregnancy may be treated with the OCPs, but if they are not uh, desire of self pregnancy, they can be treated with the DA or oral contraceptives. So after the initiation of the dopamine agonist therapy, the therapy may be discontinued and tapered and perhaps discontinued for after two years. So if they don't have any elevated serum prolactin and they don't have a visible tumor remnant on MRI. So if the MRI is okay, if the prolactin is okay, we could think about stopping uh, the DA therapy after two years.
So resistant and malignant prolactinoma. So resistant prolactinoma and malignant prolactinoma, the management. So if the prolactinoma in uh, symptomatic patients, if they don't achieve the normal prolactin levels or there is no significant reduction in the tumor size, uh, if uh, even if they are on a standard dose of DA, these are called resistant prolactinomas. So the first step is to increase the dose than performing a surgery. If they are on bromocryptin, switch them to carbogolin. So dopamine agonist resistance, it includes a failure to achieve a normal prolactin level on maximally tolerated dose of dopamine agonist and a failure to achieve a 50% reduction in tumor size. So the mechanism of dopamine, dopamine agonist resistance is not completely understood. It could be a possible that there is a decreased number of D2 receptors expressed on the resistant prolactinomas. But as of now, no dopamine receptor mutations uh, or no changes in the do dopamine receptor binding has been reported. And microadenomas are less resistant to dopamine agonists than macroadenomas. And men are likely more to be resistant than women. So men show more dopamine agonist resistance than women. Even though high dose of carbocholin may be used to overcome the resistance, uh, caution should be taken because uh, with the protracted use of high dose carbocholin, there is a potential risk of cardiac valvular regurgitation. The dose increases should be stepwise and it should be guided by the prolactin levels. So why switch uh, prolactin, bromocryptin to, uh, to carbogolin in resistance? Because from bromocryptin decreases pituitary tumor size in only approximately 50% uh, of the cases, whereas carbogolin uh, would decrease the tumor size in 90% of the cases. And also, if the patient are resistant to bromocryptin. With carbogolin therapy, they may achieve prolactin normalization. So, when uh, when should we consider surgery? To symptomatic patients with prolactinomas who cannot tolerate high doses of carbogolin or who are not responsive to dopamine agonist therapy. So we offer the transvenoidal surgery. If there, are, uh, if there is intolerance of oral bromocryptin, intravagin administration can be attempted. So and those who fail surgical treatment or who have aggressive or malignant uh, prolactinomas, radiation therapy is suggested. And for malignant pro prolactinomas, temazolamide is recommended now. So a malignant prolactinoma is defined as one that exhibits metastatic spread within or outside the CNS. So malignant pro prolactinomas in general are rare. It is not possible to differentiate between carcinoma and adenoma histologically and there are no reliable pathological markers where the malignant potential of a prolactinoma can be predicted. And treatment of the malignant tumors is difficult and survival is approximately one year. So temozolamide is considered effective in this malignant prolactinoma. So it is an alkylating agent and it has been shown to reduce prolactin levels and control tumor growth.
So prolactinoma during pregnancy. Women with prolactinomas should be instructed to discontinue the dopamine agonist therapy as soon as they discover that they are pregnant. Why? Because bromocryptin crosses the placenta and fetal drug exposure is likely for up to the first four weeks after conception. So this is a critical period for early organogenesis. However, the incidence of congenital malformations or abortions was not increased. The preponderance of evidence is that there will be no harm when the fetus is exposed to bromocryptin or carbogolin early in pregnancy. So even though no reports have been there, still since the bromocryptin crosses the placenta, it is advised to stop when the woman finds out that she is pregnant. Cunegolide, on the other hand, has a poor safety profile in this context. So in selected patients, who become uh, pregnant on dopaminergic therapy and who have had no prior surgical or radiation therapy, in selected patients with macroadenomas, sometimes it may be uh, prudent to continue this dopaminergic uh, therapy throughout the pregnancy, especially if the tumor is invasive or averting the optic chiasm. So in selected patients with macroadenoma, sometimes you will have to continue the dopaminergic therapy if the tumor is invasive or if it is averting the optic asm. There is no need to perform serum prolactin during pregnancy. This is because during pregnancy, serum prolactin levels increase tenfold. Also, the pituitary gland increases in volume more than twofold, primarily due to estrogen stimulated increase in the number of lactotrophs. Moreover, serum prolactin levels may not increase during the pregnancy in all patients with prolactinomas. So it's quite variable. So pregnancy may ameliorate antipartum hyperprolactinemia because postpartum serum prolactin levels are frequently lower than levels observed before contraception. And in some cases, hyperprolactinemia may resolve entirely after the pregnancy. So there is uh, no value of doing a serum prolactin test, test during the pregnancy. Also, the society does not recommend the use of routine pituitary MRI during pregnancy unless there is clinical evidence for tumor growth, such as a visual field compromise. So why do we think of MRI? Because of the concern that macroprolactinomas may grow during pregnancy. Microadenomas are highly unlikely to expand during pregnancy. In general, microprolactinomas and macroprolactinomas that are located to the cella do not undergo symptomatic growth during pregnancy. But there is a risk that macroadenomas may grow in size so uh, if there is a, a new or worsening headache or a change in vision it both mandates urgent performance and formal visual field testing and a pituitary MRI without the use of gadolinium so without using the contrast, you have to do it if there is a no ons new onset of worsening headache or a change in vision.
so in women who don't have uh, who don't achieve the tumor shrinkage with dopamine agonist therapy or who cannot tolerate bromocriptin or carbogolin so the potential benefits of surgical resection before attempting pregnancy and also the harms and also the adverse effects should be discussed so who have uh, who experienced severe headaches or visual changes during the pregnancy formal visual field assessment followed by mri without gadolinium should be done and they also recommend bromocriptine therapy in patients who experience symptomatic growth of prolactin during pregnancy so women who don't have who haven't achieved the tumor shrinkage with da or who cannot tolerate the da's a surgical resection should be offered and formal visual field assessment so this is for macroprolactinomas okay not for the microprolactinomas for the macroprolactinomas if they haven't achieved the tumor shrinkage with the da therapy or they cannot tolerate it the potential benefits of surgical resection should be offered before attempting pregnancy this is because macroprolactinomas may enlarge in size and also formal visual field assessment followed by mri Uh, without contrast should be done if they are experiencing severe headaches or visual field changes on the top of that wrong wrong routine can be added who experience symptoms uh, who experience sim- uh, who shows symptomatic growth of the prolactinoma during pregnancy thank you